Hi, I'm James Verdeer, and welcome to the American Institute of Biological Sciences Bioscience Talks, which is a forum for integrating the life sciences. Today, I had the great fortune to be joined by two guests I've long hoped to have on the show. They're Dave Meech, Senior Research Scientist with the U.S. Geological Survey and an adjunct professor at the University of Minnesota, and David Osband, who is also with the USGS and housed at the Idaho Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit in Moscow, Idaho. They were here to talk about their recent Bioscience Forum article, The Challenges of Success, Future Wolf Conservation and Management in the United States. I'll include a link to the article in the show notes, but in the meantime, let's go straight to the interview. Thank you both very much for joining me today. Uh, yeah, glad to do it. Okay, so we're going to be talking about um, you know wolf conservation and recovery today. I was hoping you could give me just a quick overview to get our listeners started out of how things are going. You know, um, how have wolves been doing in the United States over the past thirty or so years? Yeah, very well. They've spread. <laughs> they've spread from uh, just a state or two. Uh, not just spread, but uh, there was some reintroduction, of course. But um, but. Uh, 20, 30 years ago, they lived in basically in Minnesota, and they they now live in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan in the Midwest. And um, uh, 30 years ago, there just weren't any in the out west, and now they're in Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, parts of Oregon, Washington, and California. Um, so, uh, you know, that's doing pretty well. There was also the reintroduction into... Um, uh, New Mexico and Arizona of the Mexican wolf. And, you know, just as a, as a general matter, are, are those, you know, kind of either reintroduced or spread populations uh, large or substantial? Are they having, you know, effects on ecosystems or are we talking, you know, a, a, a stray wolf here and there? Uh, yeah, I guess I can jump in here. I mean, the Midwest has literally thousands of wolves across those three states, and it's the same here in the Intermountain West across the states that uh, Dr. Meach just mentioned. And there's also uh, a recent pack, I think, still in the corner of Colorado. Uh, so they've really spread. It's thousands of wolves. They're now uh, ecosystem effects I, I'm not so sure about. I'll let maybe Dr. Meach can speak to that. But um, there's certainly a, a, a dominant predator in these systems now. And that makes them, that makes the whole recovery quite successful. Okay. So you've got, you know, you have this large recovered population that's, you know, doing quite well, but whenever we discuss wolves, we always inevitably end up talking about human wildlife conflict or, um, you know, predator livestock conflict. Uh, what are some of the issues that have developed as a result of, you know, this broadening population? Well, as you mentioned, um, you know, there is the, the um, usual conflict with, uh, between wolves and humans regarding uh, the um, livestock that humans like to raise. And that's an issue across most areas uh, where wolves live, not just in the US, but um, uh, all across uh, much of Europe and some in Asia as well. Uh, that is conflicts in Asia as well. Uh, about the only place where you don't get real conflicts uh, between wolves and humans is in the northern parts of Canada where there's no livestock raising. But otherwise, most places where wolves live, there are livestock, and livestock are one of the prey animals of wolves. Right. And so, you know, how severe a problem is that in, you know, more or less practical terms? Um, is it something that's best characterized as occasional predation, or are we talking about something that's an actual and significant expense to ranchers? Uh, yeah, James, it's a good question. Um, I think sometimes what I hear, uh, and I'd like to get Dr. Meachie's opinion here, uh, sometimes I'll hear people that, that like wolves will say, um, well, they're not a significant effect on the livestock industry. They eat like 0.0001% of all the cow deaths a year, right? Cow and sheep. And, and that's a, that's actually a fact. It's true but it's missing some important context. So I think it is true as a livestock industry, they're generally not detrimentally affected by wolf predation, but a single producer can be very affected by wolf predation because those wolves come back to the same place, the same cows, the same sheep over and over again. So the burden ends up on one person and that's where the rub is to me. And that's that's a really good point too, because when you think when you think about it, 
<clears throat> when you think about a wolf's life, or wolves as a pack, when you think about their life, uh, without livestock somewhere, uh, these animals have to go around day after day after day, traveling miles, say 20, 25 miles a day, trying to find some prey that they can find, that they can catch and kill. And you probably understand that they have a pretty low success rate, so that's a pretty tough life. However, put livestock in the picture, and one of the first things that, uh, one of the, f the first differences is that those livestock are usually in the same place at the, day after day. So all of a sudden, you know, that cuts 20 miles off the wolves uh, need to travel that certain day. They just know where the livestock are and off they go. And, and, and then once they get there, they're not confronted with a creature that can run away far and uh, before the wolves get there. And uh, like, for example, in Minnesota, white-tailed deer, you know, if a deer senses a wolf, and when it does, uh, it's gone. And the wolves, you know, may not ever even catch up to it. Uh, you take a sheep or a cow even in a pasture, um, you know, it's still there when the wolf comes. And, and so it's a much easier type of living to kill domestic livestock than it is their natural prey. Right. I think that's that's a very interesting point that it can you know, have a disproportionate effect on a relatively small number of landholders or ranchers. Is there any good recourse for those who have livestock in those areas and would you know like to protect their flocks or herds? Yeah, I think um, there's lots of tools out there. I think Europe has kind of mastered this <laughs> a couple thousand years ago. Uh, they they tend to have a person or people out with their um, animals, they have guard dogs uh, that kind of warn them when a wolf is around so the human can go uh, intercede. Um, and of course, there's lots of other things that have been tested. Fladry, which is like little flags that kind of make, make a pasture look like a used car lot, but wolves kind of get freaked out by the fladry for a little bit and maybe don't approach. Um, there's sirens, all kinds of things. Uh, wolves tend to get used to that stuff pretty quickly, I would say. And seeing Dr. Meach nod here, uh, so it, it's usually a short, short-lived reprieve till wolves figure it out that oh, it's just a flag, <laughs> and they go back to that super predictable food source that Dr. Meach was talking about. Right. Yeah, and one of the um, one of the fairly good. Um, or, or I should say effective approaches in some areas, uh, if you have a um, small herd of something, is uh, by f fencing. And there are certain fences that it's hard for wolves to get through. However, uh, there's an experiment going on now in Minnesota where um, on, a, on a ranch where they've had um, persistent depredations over a period of years, uh, this is on sheep, uh, the um, Wildlife Services and uh, some of the uh, wolf researchers in Minnesota have put up a seven-mile fence to protect those sheep. And that, we thought, was really going to work well until, and, and this, this fence has an apron on it, so to prevent digging under, but they found that one wolf can still dig under it and another one can still jump over it. So although it's working, you know, generally well, there are some individuals that uh, can thwart even that protection. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, Dave, you might have run into this. Uh, I, I talked to a couple collar companies and we're like, hey, you know, we make GPS collars now for wildlife that you can you can pre-program a map into that collar and say, send me a text message when this animal goes into this area and I was like why can't I don't want a text message can't you just shock the wolf like save the energy on sending me a text and just zap the wolf when it gets near a place I don't want it to be and commercial collar suppliers will not bite on that and the reason I've been given from my N is two here right a small sample but uh it's perception they don't want to be perceived as uh, you know torturing animals, I guess. 
So I think there are tools we could use, uh, but people don't understand like, okay, you can shock a wolf and maybe keep it away from some cows. The other option is that wolf gets shot, right? Like the, I would think of a shock would be better, but I, that can be hard to convince people, right. I guess. Well, and even if there was a foolproof um, device like that, that is foolproof in every respect in terms of, um, of acceptability by the public and everything else, you have to catch each wolf to put that collar on. So, I mean, yeah. it's only applicable to those individual animals. And, and there have been a lot of experiments like that, you know, um, and people have tried those things. Uh, but, um, you know, they're only that good that you've got to catch each wolf to apply it. So that's not going to be a, a really much of a, a detriment to, uh, uh, to the, or I shouldn't, say, I shouldn't say a detriment, but not, not that much of, a, of an improvement in how we try to de deal with these issues. And, and I might as well throw right in here right now because I'm going to say it sooner or later here. The, the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has had to contend with this type of issue for decades uh, between coyotes and sheep. I mean, that's been going on forever. And they have spent literally hundreds of millions of dollars trying to solve this problem. And, you know, it's still out there. I mean, sure, do guard dogs do tend to work fairly well between dogs and, uh, or, sorry, between wolves and sheep. But uh, it's not foolproof by any means. You've got to have a lot of them, and it sure helps to have a shepherd right along with them. And you can't, get, you can't hire many shepherds these days in the, in the U.S. In Europe, that's fine, but not here. Um, so this is not a simple issue to try to solve. Let's take a moment and talk about some of the other potential, you know, stakeholders in this very broad system of, of you know, wolf recovery and um, policy response there, too. Uh, you know, who else is in the mix? I, I, you know, I think of someone like myself, and I'm, I'm sort of in a way the perfect city slicker um, in that, you know, I have access to, you know, nice public lands that are open where I would love to see wolves. Um, and yet I don't actually at all face any of the detriments that accrue to those who actually live near them. Um, you know, kind of who are the major groups, um, you know, who are involved here and are, you know, having a say or attempting to have a say in management? I'll jump in. Um, in the West here, I'll speak mostly to that because that's where m most of my experience is. Uh, it definitely depends on the region that you're in for who, what stakeholder is wielding influence. Uh, here in the West, it's certainly livestock producers have a strong influence. They have a, a pretty good representation in the state legislatures around here. So they're, they might be small in number, but they're mighty. <laughs> uh, and then um, actually out here, uh, hunters, uh, sportsmen and women who hunt have a really big influence on wolf policy and management. They can have... Uh, views about wolves that that might match reality you know maybe maybe wolves have reduced prey population sometimes it's perception uh, they don't see deer and elk where they used to see deer and elk but they see wolf tracks now uh, but they have a really strong influence on both the uh, fish and wildlife management agencies but also with their connections in the legislature and the legislature can can put the screws to the agency to respond to that so those are, I would say, the two groups here in the West. I don't, I'm not as familiar with the Midwest or other places. And out here in the Midwest, um, um, the um, it, it's the same basically. Um, but um, you know, um, guiding organizations as well, because of course they they have a, uh, a vested interest in in um, seeing that their clients are successful. And it is true that that when you have wolves in an area, not only do they generally reduce uh, prey individuals in the, in the herd, uh, but they also uh, make each member of the herd just that much more wary, and, and it, that applies to when they're being hunted by humans as well. So, you know, that can be an issue. Um, and then uh, Dr. Osmond mentioned the, the, um, uh, the effect of hunters and um, and others on the state legislature, um, when they go directly to the legislature, 
I mean, that's pretty powerful. That, that can overcome uh, any of the recommendations by biologists in the, in the agencies in those same states. So the, the pros, uh, who are pro wildlife managers, basically, who may have one approach to managing wolves, um, they're in one position, but it's the legislature that can over, actually overrule them. And there's a state law in um, Wisconsin here that when the wolf is off the endangered species list, it has to be subject to human hunting. I mean, that's a that's a law. That's not something that that the uh, Game and Fish Department has come up with. That's a state law. I was going to add here, James. Um, certainly, another stakeholder are uh, environmental or wildlife advocacy groups. Right? They do have a role. Uh, Generally, here in the West, I would say that their influence is most mostly through the courts. Yeah. Now that's where they get their leverage because um, they don't necessarily always have the ear of the legislature that maybe some other groups do. Uh, but they do get influence through other ways, and that was one of the things we brought up in our our paper. Yeah, the um, Center for Biological Diversity is a big one in that respect, and. Um, as you're probably aware, <clears throat> there have been several lawsuits that have uh, restored the the wolf once it was delisted. It restored it back to the endangered species list through the lawsuits. Right. That, that's really fascinating. Let's let's talk very briefly about um, you know the way in which these populations are generally managed. You know, you've you've discussed the um, you know fish and wildlife organizations legislation. Um, so after the delisting under the Endangered Species Act, um, it's pretty much been a matter that's handled by the states, right? Yes. Yes. That's according to the Constitution. You know, uh, all the um, uh, resident wildlife. Uh, by way of the Constitution, the, the U.S. Constitution, uh, is to be handled by the states. Right. And you describe this, you know, in the article, this um, relatively tricky situation in which you've got a number of different stakeholders influencing the, the management uh, decisions through any number of means. Would there be a better way of doing that? You know, what, what should potentially, um, you know, those in positions to make decisions be looking at in terms of management and decision making? Because right now, uh, what you're describing sounds like a, a bunch of disparate stakeholders that are, you know, sometimes not working from empirical evidence, perhaps, or, uh, you know, have powerful vested interests or moneyed interests. Um, would there be a better way to do this? <laughs> I see, I see Dr. Meech pointing uh you started with a should question, James, and that always scares scientists. Uh, so I won't interject my values here, but I, uh, you know, I I will say that uh, the disparate interest that you're talking about uh, does create a big a bit of a tug of war. But the where I see the problem is is when um, that that tug of war becomes. Uh, disproportionate. So one group takes an, an unusual end run, say uh, a court decision requires an agency to do something, or a ballot initiative requires an agency to do something. That's when you're in a tug of war where that can go against you if the other side gets more power than you have, right? So that puts wolves on this seesaw of where their management policy is headed, just based on who has influence. And I don't think that's really great for wolves, personally. Yeah, and uh, James, we were talking about this before we actually started. Uh, Dave and I were talking about this, and I mentioned that many years ago, probably 15, maybe 20 years ago, I published an article uh, that kind of dealt with that issue. Um, and b basically, uh, I ended the article by saying, if, if, entities other than the professional wildlife managers uh, were managing wildlife, that probably we could end up with California having all the large carnivores and North Dakota not having any, because that's, you know, that's what it comes down to. So what kind of effects does this have on wolf populations when they're managed either in this, you know, seesaw type fashion or obviously eradication is its own thing. But, uh, you know, does that have implications for their success in establishing populations, maintaining them healthily, et cetera? 
the seesaw of small populations can can be a problem you know here say in idaho where i live we've got i don't know thousand wolves uh uh a year to year battle probably doesn't affect the population that much but i will say that um so the there was a seesaw in 2009 ish wolves got delisted here in uh, in the rockies by congress a budget rider uh because it couldn't get through the courts so they were 2009 they were taken off the endangered species list there was a hunting season in 2010 2011 they were back on the list because of a court decision then finally congress was like yeah we're done here and they're delisted well that uh back and forth on and off the endangered species list really created distrust in the sportsmen and women community that were like oh okay finally we have enough wolves we can i can if i don't like wolves or i think there are too many i can have a hunting tag in my pocket i have some power and then you change the goalpost on me and you put them back on the list and that created a lot of mistrust and I, maybe dr meach can speak to more of that in the midwest because they've had similar things happen well what actually happened is that <clears throat> the um there, there were recovery plans written uh, basically by pros, professional wildlife managers, uh, to um, help recover wolves and to set the criteria for recovery. And uh, for example, the one out west, um, the, the biological criteria for recovery was uh, essentially 100 wolves in each of three areas of the out west, uh, or 10, 10 packs of 10 or so, um, for three consecutive years, and um, and that would be the criteria for the biological criteria for delisting. Well, when that happened, that is when wolves reached uh, met that criterion, the wolf did not go off the list. And so, as this happened over time, they kept reproducing, and so they kept increasing beyond those those set points, and um, that. Uh, the seesaw effect that Dave mentioned uh, occurred then, and you'd have so you'd have these um, these wolves starting to increase in each of these three areas. That would have been the, um, the, essentially Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho, um, and that um, uh, the public thinking that and uh, the public in those states thinking that when the wolves reached those numbers, they would come off the list. So when they didn't, the public really got upset about it all and distrusted the government because the government had, it was sort of implied that when the re wolves reached those numbers, they would go off the list. The lawsuits prevented them from going off the list and it went back and forth uh, several times. That is the wolves went off the list, back on, off the list, back on because the lawsuits back on and then off again and back on. This happened three or four times. And uh, the public got fed up with it. The politicians took over and said, look, um, forget, they use different words, forget the Endangered Species Act. We're passing a law that, um, that says they're delisted. And that's how they got delisted in Montana, Wyoming, well, t Montana and Idaho, and eventually Wyoming and then uh, parts of um, Oregon, Washington, and uh, Utah. And they remained off the list because part of that law said, as part of this law, there can be no lawsuits against it. And, and that, <laughs> that has so far persisted. Yeah. That's, that's and they're still amazing. the only ones off the list, actually. Yeah. I, James, I think back to your original question, I think... Uh, that history that Dr. Meach is talking about, that seesaw and that distrust from from politicians who have been around for a while know the history. Um, if they're in other states, they may not want to get in the wolf business, <laughs> basically, because because they've seen that, man, if they're on the list, I, I never get them off. I never get control of my own wildlife population. That's not a business they necessarily want to be in. 
Yeah, that sounds like an enormous barrier. Uh, just in the interest of time, I'd like to you know ask a last question, which is you know what can we expect on the horizon for wolves, wolf recovery, wolf management? You know what kinds of things should we be on the lookout for? Well, um, I guess we could each speak to that. I, um, I think we're going to see wolves in a lot in a lot more places. I mean, there are enough on the landscape now, both in the Midwest uh, and um, and out west, that um, they will just continue to do what they're doing. I mean, there's going to be there is some state regulation in uh, Montana and Wyoming and, and um, Idaho, and it could develop in other states as well. But even so, there are enough wolves out there right now that, as far as I would guess, uh, they're going to continue to expand. I mean, they they have a way of showing up. Uh, for example, in California, they just showed up 200 miles from the nearest breeding population. All of a sudden, there's a, a new pack there. So they have ways of doing this, and um, I think we're going to see that uh, continue. And that's why we, we wrote that article. I mean, I think uh, we both understand that. I'll let Dave speak for himself, but, but this is going to be the future uh, for uh, well, I shouldn't say this is going to be the future for quite a while because that's a tautology. But anyway, that's that is going to be the future. Yeah, I I agree. Uh, I I think it was you, Doctor Meach, that I heard at a conference say that uh, wolf habitat it could be a parking lot as long as there's garbage to eat and shade from a car. <laughs> yes, wolves are like crazy adaptable, super smart. They'll live anywhere humans tolerate them. That's really the the sticking point. So I agree. I think we're going to see wolves in a lot more places, provided humans tolerate them and, and live with the consequences of having wolves around, the occasional conflict and discomfort of seeing a wolf in your yard kind of thing. <laughs> so expect California to have a lot of them. Right. It sounds like there's going to be quite a lot to look forward to in the future. Um, I'd just like to thank both of you very much for joining me today. Uh, thank you, James. It's been fun. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And that concludes this episode of Bioscience Talks. Just a reminder, the journal Bioscience is published by Oxford University Press on behalf of the American Institute of Biological Sciences and is made possible by the support of our members and donors. Thank you and talk to you next time.